presentation of dialogue on Idaho Public Television is made possible through the generous support of the Laura Moore Cunningham Foundation, committed to fulfilling the Moore and Bettis family legacy of building the great state of Idaho. By the Friends of Idaho Public Television and by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. This was written four centuries ago and we can still laugh at it and have fun. And isn't, isn't, that, isn't that amazing? Coming up, a conversation about one of the rarest books in the world, the first folio of William Shakespeare's plays. That's Dialogue Next. Stay tuned. All the world's a stage. What's past is prologue. Something wicked this way comes. They're some of the most famous quotes from the works of William Shakespeare, but all of them would have been lost to time were it not for this book. Hi, I'm Marcia Franklin, and I'm standing next to a rare first folio of Shakespeare's plays. Published in 1623 by several of the Bard's friends, it was the first time that his plays had been compiled together and the first time that 18 of them had been published at all. Experts have now found 235 copies of the books out of an estimated 800 that were printed. This volume is one of 82 owned by the Folger Shakespeare Library in Washington, D.C. It's on display at Boise State University through September 20th, part of a nationwide commemoration of Shakespeare's death 400 years ago. Now, a few scholars have devoted their professional lives, not to mention a large chunk of their personal ones as well, to studying these books. And one of them joins me now to talk more about the tome's importance. He's Professor Eric Rasmussen from the University of Nevada, Reno. Welcome. Thank you. Or perhaps I should say, how now, sir? <laughs> you come most carefully upon your hour. Uh, Thank you. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here, Mark, with this wonderful book. Well, you've seen many of them, and actually, you're one of the people that has physically touched them. We can't, I can't. It's very tempting, too. Uh, but for obvious reasons, it's, it's enclosed. So many people are coming through to, to look at it. But what is it like to touch one? It's interesting, uh, the paper has stood the test of time, hasn't it? It has, and, and it's rag paper made out of rags. So it's cloth, and it's very soft to the touch. And the hand letter press means that it, they press through uh, and it, so it almost has a braille feel uh, on, the, on, the op on the verso page. So it, they're, they're really remarkable objects. And um, actually, because it is rag paper, you don't necessarily need to use gloves with it, right? I mean, you know, you... It, it, it's, gloves are actually going to uh, do more damage to the book than... The, the acids in your fingers are not going to affect the, the paper at all, as it would with 19th century wood pulp paper. Now, um, this is a box because so many people are coming through um, and because it uh, is pretty expensive, right? Potentially, I mean, there's a, there's a range on these things, but up to $6 million for six, one recently? $6 million is what Paul Allen, the co-founder of Microsoft, paid for it recently, yes. And it's got a temperature control in it and everything. This is a, this is a baby book. <laughs> <laughs> I got that little baby monitor in there, right? <laughs> So it has to be kept at a certain temperature. And humidity, well. I think, also is controlled. Uh -huh. And that's because, obviously, it could start to de degrade if it were in conditions that were... I think mold could start to grow and things that they're, they're, they're concerned about. But they're, these, these books, as you say, are very well looked after, including the transportation here from, uh, from Washington, D.C. Yeah, how does that work? I, my understanding is that there were temperature-controlled uh, couriers that were involved. And, and with the book all the time, you know, maybe with a, right. what is it called, Bodleian chain? <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> so the way they used to be chained in the library. Exactly. The, the Bodleian uh, copy in, in Oxford was chained to the, to, to the shelf. And the wonderful thing about that book is that the most thumbed play of the 17th century Oxford <laughs> undergraduates was Romeo and Juliet. I wonder of, why. Just kind of sweet <laughs> that the, the story of lo young lovers appealed to them. Now, this is one of 82 first folios owned by the Folger Shakespeare Library, bought by the uh, progenitor of the, of the library, Mr. Folger. There was kind of a, a little bit of a competition going on among early industrialists in America to buy these up, right? Henry Huntington, who built the Transcontinental Railroad, uh, bought four copies, uh, as well as uh, the, a manuscript of Chaucer and an elephant folio of Audubon's Birds of America. And then Henry Clay Folger, who was Rockefeller's partner in Standard Oil, uh, bought 82. Um, so they were, 
He, he won out. He won. <laughs> <laughs> well, how many books like this exist in the United States of America? I think there are about 100 in America now, and including the 82 at the Folger and another 18 scattered about. Describe what it was like to first open up one of these and page through it. There, there's some power involved, and, and it really is that you, you feel a sense of connection to Shakespeare, because this is, you know, this is the conduit through which, as you were mentioning in, in your introduction, many of his texts uh, would not exist without this. And we wouldn't have Macbeth if we didn't have this book. And so that's, uh, the importance of that uh, is, is tangible. It's, it's, it's almost electric. Well, let's go sit down and talk more about why you're so fascinated with this book and more about its importance. Great. So you and your team have uh, tracked down 230-some of these folios, examined them all, every single page that you can get at, at any rate, uh, every detail of those pages. Tell me a little bit about this obsession with well, the first folio. <laughs> well, the, the, the idea of a catalog resume is recording all the data about every book. And that's not going to be interesting to every person, but it's going to be interesting to some. There are some people who are really interested in book bindings. And the Shakespeare First Folio was not sold bound. You would just buy its 900 pages and take it off to your, your own binder. So they're, they're each unique. There wasn't a, an original binding. And so there are 235 different bindings for this book. Some original pigskin, some are rebound in the 19th century and very lavish. Uh, leathers and, and gildings and things. So it is amazing how individual each each book is. And I guess our obsession with the first folio just carries on from uh, the obsession that this book has, 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 or the fascination that this book has held uh, for hundreds of years. Uh, not only Henry Huntington and Henry Clay Folger uh, fetishizing them to the point of, of collecting 82 uh, copies, um, but it, it really, it, it's just, it, it has had an attraction for, uh, for, for many, many centuries. And we, we really wanted to do a catalog that recorded every little idi idiosyncrasy of every book, every, every little marginal annotation, any time someone was smoking um, and, and left burn marks on or, or a wine stain. We've, we've seen them all. Or a kitty cat walking across one of them, right? <laughs> exactly. A cat with dirty paws walked across their first folio. So is the interest and the queasy obs obsession with these, does it have to do with your love of Shakespeare? Does it have to do with the hunt for more of them? Does it have to do with seeing who owned them and all these little um, evidences of where the book was. What is it about? I, I, I think all of those. I think you're 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 exactly right that this be this is the original of of 18 of Shakespeare's plays. So anyone with an interest in Shakespeare, even a passing interest in Shakespeare, is uh, is interested in the first folio uh, because this is this is the first edition of uh, of, of of text that we really value. Um, but also it, it it is the 400 years of the history of this book. Uh, Make it, make it, they each have little lives and they've each, you know, we, we know of a copy that went down with a, with a, uh, a, a transatlantic liner in, in 1912. We know that a copy was burned up in the Chicago fire. And we, so it's, it's, a, it, it's, it's an amazing story. Uh, and it's not just 35 um, of the same book, it's 35 individual books. How do you get across the importance of this book to, say, school children who come to look at it? I had somebody say to me, what you should do is you should record kids coming in here after they've been told they're going to see something special running from the bus. Then they come in here and it's just a book. <laughs> you should take a look at their faces because some of them are disappointed. It's just a book to them. It's not doing anything. It's not moving. It's, it's just a book. How do you get across the excitement that you have? I, I, I think you have to use uh, I ha you have to use drama. You have to use plays. You have to take them to a uh, a production that really energizes them, and they, they, they see and then say, you know what? This is four hundred years old, and this 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 play that you're laughing at and having fun, uh, this was written four centuries ago, and we can still laugh at it and have fun. And isn't isn't that isn't that amazing? And you know, we think we think things are old if it's 
last week's newspaper. Uh, and, and here is, here is a, 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 a book that, that's 400 years, almost 400 years old. Um, let's talk about why this folio even exists. Shakespeare's plays were originally in what were called quartos, little comic book-like things, or not even published at all. Just, just manuscripts, right, that were passed around? Exactly. And, you know, during Shakespeare's lifetime, as you say, um, half of his plays, 18, were published in quartos. And these were apparently the popular plays. And, and interestingly, they're not, not the plays that we necessarily consider popular now. Henry, Henry IV and some of the history plays were, seemed to be the best sellers. Uh, some plays never got printed during Shakespeare's lifetime, plays like Macbeth and The Tempest and Julius Caesar and As You Like It. Which are some of the most performed plays now. Exactly. Our, our popular plays, were, we've, we've, we've shifted in terms of popularity. And in the Elizabethans, uh, they, they were much more interested in the history plays, for instance, than we are. But so, after, you know, after seven years after Shakespeare's death, uh, as you mentioned in your intro, two of his fellow actors uh, decided that they were going to gather the com complete works and publish it in this grand book, The Folio. And folios had only been used before this for very, you know, important works of history and theology and philosophy and for Bibles. So the idea of publishing plays uh, in folio was almost scandalous. It would be what, tantamount to uh, publishing the scripts of a, a TV series or something? It, it, exactly. And at the, at the time, people uh, weren't quite sure what to make of it. Ben, ben Johnson, one of Shakespeare's contemporaries, had published his works, uh, which included plays in folio. But he'd also included poetry and uh, masks and more literary uh, things. And people made fun of him. People said, you're calling those works? Well, you don't know the difference between work and play. And the idea that these are popular entertainment, they're not, they shouldn't be considered literature. So the Shakespeare First Folio is the first time that anyone had said, no, we should take these th seriously. We should not uh, treat them as ephemeral, uh, but as something that is, needs to be preserved and needs to be, needs to be read in, in the future. And I think your analogy to television is really, is really a very good one because today we don't think of TV scripts as necessarily worth preserving. In fact, we would, we would giggle if someone collected the scripts for every love, Everybody Loves Raymond or something and put them in a, in a leather-bound binding. So these two actors um, decided to publish these works because they knew that they were important. They knew that they should be preserved for posterity. Or was it a monetary thing? They wanted to make sure that they were getting paid and that the, the King's Company was getting paid for uh, the p plays being performed? I, I don't think it was necessarily commercial because it was such a risky venture. This is, you, they were doing something that had never been done before, a folio uh, devoted to plays. It took two years to publish uh, the folios so and an enormous amount of capital investment and, and labor and time. And I think, and also Hemings and Condell were getting toward the end of their lives. So these, I think these were old men who decided that they really wanted to, to do something of value uh, in preserving the works for the, of their colleague. And I think they clearly had performed in the plays over the decades and, and said, you know, these are, these are really good. These are, these are different than some of the other uh, works we've been performing and we should, we, we should do something to preserve these. Now, as I mentioned in my introduction, there's an estimated 800 that were printed, some say 750. And that number comes, does it not, from the fact that we know for sure that a printer's run in those days was only a thousand copies. They, they were, there was a, a guild, the stationers, uh, uh, the stationers Guild, which regulated how many uh, copies of a book printers and publishers, and they, they, they capped it at a thousand. So you couldn't print more than that. And the idea was this would keep printers and, and publishers in work, because if you wanted to uh, publish m many more copies than that, well, you had to distribute the type and reset it and re reprint the whole book. So it, it, was a, it was a good labor practice of, of keeping, uh, keeping print shops going. But so we, we know that they couldn't have done more than a thousand. We also think that it was because it was so risky, um, maybe they were hedging their bets and only printing maybe as few as 500. Maybe uh, I, I think your estimate about 800 is about right. One of the things I found very interesting reading the Shakespeare Thefts, which is your book for lay people about this 
journey of yours and your team is that the printers who, who, who you know, had this major assignment, they would assign things to compositors, right, that would set the, the type. And those people were kind of all over the place in terms of their education and their age, and some of them made errors. How do we know when we look at a first folio, if there's been errors introduced, that it really is the real words of Shakespeare? That sometimes if we've got a good quarto text, we can compare it. And sometimes we, uh, sometimes the errors are just, they're hilarious. There was, uh, there was a one compositor who was an apprentice and he did really funny things. There's a line in Hamlet when Hamlet talks about the life-giving pel pelican because the, the myth is that the mother pelican would pierce her own breast in order to feed her children with her blood. Uh, this compositor changed it to life-giving politician, uh, which is really, uh, make, make, makes no sense, but clearly he well, was trying to. politicians would like it. They, uh, politicians <laughs> would, would, would love it, but he, he clearly was trying to puzzle out. And then. Uh, and so we figured out that because. Because in the quarto, okay. it says the life-giving pelican, and that makes sense in, in, but in context. For the plays that had never been published before, That's for the, which we don't have those quartos, how do we know that compositors didn't introduce all sorts of errors into them? And that this is where editorial judgment comes into play. Um, but you're exactly right. For plays that are unique to the folio, we just don't know if, uh, if, if an apprentice has you know, had difficulty reading a manuscript well, you yourself, um, back in t 2014, were asked to authenticate a supposed folio in, in, in France and you in Saint-Omer, and you went over, and indeed, there it was. It you, was. You, you were not necessarily convinced over the phone or whatever that they had it, but once you saw it, you knew. I, I, I thought they might, might have found an, an old facsimile, but in point of fact, they had an original first folio, and it's with original first folio handmade paper. Uh, and it cre created quite a stir. So it doesn't take long, as I understand it, for you to authenticate these things. Uh, there, there are certain key things you look for in a folio in order to authenticate it, yes? It, it, it is the, the paper especially. This is unique, handmade, watermark, chain-lined paper. And there are 19 watermarks that we know were used in the paper for the first folio. And in no other books in the period except for uh, two or three that were printed by the same print shop at the same time they were, they were printing the Shakespeare folio. Uh, so if you, if you find one of these, you've, you've, you've got a first folio. And if you, if you don't, you, you probably have a 19th century facsimile, uh, some of which were, were done really, really well. But that's on wood pulped 19th century paper, which is a very different object. In the Shakespeare thefts, um, your, your book about this process. There's some great stories in there about the books, about the personalities of the books, if you can call it that, or maybe the associations of the books. Uh, there's a folio that has a bullet hole through it. And a musket bullet hole going halfway through it. It, it, it stops at Titus Andronicus, which I think is an impenetrable play. So. <laughs> and uh, there are uh, eccentrics who own some of these books. One man had corners that were, had been chewed off by a rodent and he went to the extent of? He, he bought original pages uh, for the ones that had been chewed. Uh, there are book dealers who, who stock such things for, for just such uh, wealthy collectors. But then he cut off the corners of the good pages and pasted them on to the corners that had been chewed off and I I, I, I don't understand that, but it's his book. He can do what he wants. What's interesting to me um, in learning more about this, I'm fascinated by the marginalia, by what people write in, in the books. I mean, we think of it as just this you know, very precious book, and, and it was, but people still used it for all manner of things. They would write their thoughts about the various lines or maybe musings about somebody that they had a cr crush on or... I think that the marginalia is fascinating. It's, it gives the, each book its own life. And it, and it really does personalize, as you say, each one. And it, it's, it is fascinating because we, we, we treat it as a sacred relic. But in the 400 years of its history, people just saw, well, there's some blank space here, so I can, I can do my household accounts. 
or, or you know, the, uh, a, there's, there's one copy where a young child is practicing her ABCs, and, and you can see them making, making the, the letter formations, and that's, wow. <laughs> so in a sense, through the book, you can also see history in its pages of the people who owned it. Absolutely. And is that what fascinates you so, sometimes the most? I, I, I think so. And that it's, it's the reason you don't need to just look at one copy of this book, because one copy has, a, has an interesting story to tell, but so does the next copy. And then, uh, and then the stories behind them. I mean, I think, I think my favorite story is the, the Royal Shakespeare Company owns a copy of a, a first folio. And in 1964, they took it to Rome uh, for a papal performance. It was during Vatican II, so the whole College of Cardinals was there. It was apparently the first time that a sitting pope had ever been to a stage play. And after their performance, they brought out their first folio and the pope was supposed to bless it. But the pope hadn't been adequately briefed and so the pope accepted it as a gift. And you can almost see the, the tug of war that must have gone on uh, on stage, but apparently the Pope, uh, in fact, they relinquished it to the Pope and uh, had to do some diplomatic negotiations to get that book back. Do you have a f favorite, if you will, or a uh, book that you've examined, either in terms of the marginalia or its history? I think one of my favorites is there's a copy at the University of Glasgow now that in the list of the actors who performed in Shakespeare's play, a very early owner had written next to some of these actors that I, I know him, and uh, I, I know him, I've heard about him. And so this was someone who had seen Shakespeare's acting company perform on stage. And that kind of connection to, you know, we're not just getting the, the, the text, but we're getting uh, you know, members of the audience, uh, had, had, and that, there's something very special about that. And what's the one you really want to find? Because I know you know some of the ones that are out there that uh, you can't get your hands on. There, there's one that's owned by a family in Japan uh, that when we first approached them, they said, well, we're, we're sorry, but uh, our husband, our late husband put in his will that no one can look at the folio until 13 years after his death. And we dutifully waited uh, 13 years. In the, in the interim, we did some research. And we discovered that the book that he, the family had owned, had a red stain on the corner of every page, a kind of, kind of cloak and daggery there. Um, but that a, that a book fitting that description had been stolen from uh, a university, John, the John Rylands Library at the University of Manchester in England in the late 1960s. So we, we suspected it, um, that it could have a link to that book. Um, but we went back after 13 years and they still wouldn't let us look at it, so we still haven't seen uh, that particular book, so we can't make that connection. It's pretty hard to steal these things now, right? Yes. <laughs> Especially with your catalog of every single page and mark on them. Part of the reason that we, we, we did the catalog was to make these identifiable so that exactly you can't, you can't steal one and sell it on the open market. Uh, I don't know what the black market for folios might be. I have to ask you, of course, um, there, there is a disagreement about whether Shakespeare even wrote all of these plays. Um, we don't have time to go into it, but uh, what, what's your sense? Do you feel convinced that he's, he's the author? Ab absolutely. And when, when you spend time looking at uh, Renaissance documents and you realize that, yes, Shakespeare was uh, you know, he was, a he was a sharer, he was an owner in his, his uh, theatrical company. Uh, there are plenty, plenty of documentary records about him. And the, the theory that Shakespeare had to be someone else uh, was formulated in the 19th century by, quite frankly, elitists in Britain who didn't believe that you could write such plays unless you were a, uh, you'd gone to university, unless you were independently wealthy, if you've traveled. And the analogy that I like is that, you know, suppose someone were to say, well, a welfare mother could not have written Harry Potter. Um, and, but in fact, she did. <laughs> uh, and I think that's very much what it is with Shakespeare. You, you could say, well, this, you know, this uncollege un educated person from Stratford upon Avon could not have done this, but in fact, he did. And that's pretty wonderful. Now, there are more out there, yes? 
you, you never know. I mean, we, we, we keep discovering more, and we keep saying, well, we've, we, we've got them all now. But uh, a few years ago, a, a woman in, in North London died in test date, and they discovered a Shakespeare first folio among her effects. So uh, it's not, not Antiques Roadshow, but who knows? <laughs> There's an interesting superstition that if you buy one of these things, it's not going to be long before you uh, have tragedy befall you. Well, it was an interesting, I had a, a research assistant who had the, you know, not, not romantic sounding job of looking up birth and death dates for all the owners of all the Shakespeare folios. And at one point she looked up to me and she said, have you noticed that many of these people die within a year of buying their first folio? And I thought that's not true, but in fact, uh, 20 or 30 owners have, have uh, met their demise within, and then sometimes in spectacular fashion. There's one fellow who was explaining the workings of a windmill to his children and got too close and was decapitated. Uh, another, another shor shortly after purchasing a first folio, went down with the Titanic. Um, so yeah, maybe, maybe there's a curse. Ultimately, um why does Shakespeare stand the test of time? Why is he still relevant today, 400 years later after his death? I, I think it's because Shakespeare, I mean, people will say he's for all time, uh, without not giving any sort of background to that. I think it's because Shakespeare is dealing with a, what we still consider to be hot button issues in the 21st century. Uh, there's a play known as Measure for Measure, it's not one of the more popular ones, uh, that deals with sexual harassment. And it, it's the kind of thing where, wow, you know, four centuries ago he was, he was working with gender and power relations and, and when a, a, a person in power uh, asks a, a woman who's going to become a nun to sleep with him and, and she says, I'll proclaim you. And he says, who's going to believe you? I'm a man, you're a woman, I'm in power, you're not. And there's just a chill that goes through 21st century readers that, oh my goodness, uh, this, is, this, is, this is why we're reading this, because this is what matters to us. Whether it's uh, issues of race or gender or power or class, uh, that's what Shakespeare uh, interrogates and, you know, and young love, so he's got it all. Well, thank you very much for taking time to talk about your work. Um, you've been listening to Professor Eric Rasmussen. He is one of the leading experts in the world on Shakespeare's first folio. That's the first time Shakespeare's plays were bound together, published in 1623. If you want to see a copy of the first folio, you can come to Boise State University until September 20th. It'll be on display. For more information, check out the Dialogue website. Just go to idahoptv.org and click on Dialogue. For Dialogue, I'm Marsha Franklin. Thanks for tuning in. presentation of Dialogue on Idaho Public Television is made possible through the generous support of the Laura Moore Cunningham Foundation, committed to fulfilling the Moore and Bettis family legacy of building the great state of Idaho. By the Friends of Idaho Public Television and by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. Check out our website, become a friend on Facebook, or follow us on Twitter.